Welcome to the Times of Israel's What Matters Now. And this time, I, Amanda Borshal Dan, am hosting our senior analyst, Chaviv Retegur, in my house again for an informal conversation. Now, I just want to lift the veil slightly. Usually, before these conversations, Chaviv and I are discussing what are we going to talk about over the course of, I don't know, even a week. But this time, because of the holiday period, I said to Chaviv last night, What do you want to discuss? And he said, Reasons for optimism in Israel's 77th year. I said, sold. So I just, before we launch in, I just want to say the Cambridge Dictionary defines optimism as the quality of being full of hope and emphasizing the good parts of a situation or a belief that something good will happen. So stay tuned to listen to all of this and more when we're back. Chaviv, we're back, and every single year, Israelis are astounded to find where we place on the World Happiness Report. And this year, we actually dropped down a little bit. Do you know what place we were this year? It was pretty famous uh, among the Israeli journalist crowd. We're number five instead of number four on Earth. Exactly. And I don't know if you noticed, there's a war going on in Israel. And last year, you might have noticed some kind of judicial overhaul attempt. And that made everyone kind of full of angst and existential threat from here and from there and from everywhere, essentially. So how do you explain this kind of number? It's a great question. The last number where we were fourth place on Earth after three Scandinavian countries was before what some Israelis think of as the year of from hell, right? The judicial reform that was tearing Israel apart and then October and the war since. But this one is from January, after the judicial reform months of political wrangling and and, and unbelievable polarization and and three months into the war. And um, I think that, you know, some of the methodology of, of how they come up with this stuff, it has to do with many, many different measures, including you know, uh, state support, you know, things like healthcare, uh, where Israel really is uh, an extraordinary world leader. Um, in, it has universal healthcare that covers things that the Canadian healthcare system doesn't, that is more affordable than just about any Western system, um, and invest massively in it. I think the actual healthcare expenditures per capita has more than doubled in the last 15 years. Um, so things like that put us high up, but they don't put us at fifth. I think that a lot of what puts us at fifth is what we call social capital. In other words, self-reported Israeli, um, ordinary Israelis say that they have the support of their communities, of their families. Israel's a small country. Israelis tend to large families. Secular Israelis tend to the larger families than any other developed nation. Um, and every other kind of Israeli, whether it's religious or Haredi Jews or, or conservative religious Muslims, have larger families than those secular Israelis. So large families that can't drive very far away from each other like you can in America or you can even in Germany, uh, tend to have real support, right? Who raises kids when the parents have to work? The grandparents. So that sense of solidarity and social support and what sociologists call social capital is intense and enveloping and I think is a big part of self-reported happiness. Happiness is not that you don't face crises or troubles or economic downturns. Happiness is the people around you. And we today in the West are seeing this epidemic of loneliness caused by mobility, caused by online, our lives moving online. Israelis might be headed in that direction, I don't know, but they are a little bit inoculated to it um, by a very conservative, large family kind of society, by a Middle Eastern part of our society, and they're a little bit inoculated to it by the small size of the country. So this uh, happiness report is made up of a slew of different uh, things, including the self-reported assessment, but it also has... GDP per capita, social support that you were discussing, healthy life expectancy, freedom, generosity, and corruption. Of course, nothing is perfect here in Israel. But one of the things that uh, struck me in reading this report very quickly is that the young in Israel are actually 
more happy than the older generation. And that is very different than what you see in many Western countries throughout the world. Right. Um, because the young are more tend to be more religious because the religious are having more kids. Um, and the young also therefore tend to look ahead at their lives as lives of strong community, strong sense of purpose. Um, the happiest Israelis, according to polls we have within Israel, are the Haredi Israelis. They live in, with the most, you know, trust in their neighbors, the most trust in their community. Um, and so, it, it, these, I think, you know, <laughs> in as much as we can measure happiness, which is a debate in and of itself, I think that happiness is the people around you. It's the absolute firm and total knowledge that if you fall, somebody's going to catch you and you will be picked up. It is me knowing that in my street, every neighbor I have, the ones I like, the ones I'm arguing with about parking spaces, is going to run into fire for my kids. And therefore, I know that I will run into fire for their kids. It is that firm knowledge which is true across Israeli society, from deep secular. Secular left-wing Israelis have, you know, draft rates in some of these secular cities of 80-90% of the young. That's not ordinary secular left-wing of the West. So, we are, we have social solidarity coming out of our ears. And that is the heart and soul of happiness. I think maybe we're the proof of that. I look at my three kids who are now in the army, you know, twins are 18 and my eldest is 20. And they and their friend group have more sense of purpose than anyone I can see. And even the most left-wing friend who is a conscientious objector of my son, who is now an uh, elite combat unit in the army, he serves in a coexistence project and tries to bridge between Palestinians and Israelis. So not to pat ourselves on the back too hard, but it is really evident that the youth of our, our youth, the people we actually created or helped create are so impressive and so really just woof, filled with sense of purpose. Yeah, the ones who don't want to draft have, a, have an astonishing sense of purpose about not drafting and a sense of community and empathy and, and community building that they go after to, to replicate the things that, you know, if you're not drafting, you feel a little distant from the politics of, let's say, the Jewish mainstream. It, it, our baseline is so healthy in this, in, this, in this thing. And when you, you know, I've been doing a little bit of traveling and speaking tours lately, and when you meet college kids on American campuses, the the ideological fervency rises as the sense of community declines. In other words, there's a sense of belonging and purposefulness found in ideology um, that just, it's this, I'm going to be judgmental, I apologize, echoing loneliness. Just, you see it, you feel it, you smell it, it's everywhere. And then when the CDC comes out with these reports that there's rising rates of suicide, all-time highs among young people in America— it's not surprising. It is just not, is that mostly because of Instagram and their online life? Or is it because of this sort of evaporation of this social, this, you know, this, uh, this what's the sociologist Putnam published decades ago, this book Bowling Alone about the evaporation of these sort of American bowling leagues and the, the all the ways in which the clubs and the church and all the ways in which Americans would get together. And now Americans mostly don't know their neighbors. Um, and that's not just America. It's true in Canada and France and Britain and Germany and, and Argentina. Um, it's huge. If we're going to have a podcast about optimism, folks, there's uh, Amanda and I believe there's a lot wrong in Israel. And we talk about it in English and we talk about it in Hebrew. Um, a huge, huge number of things to fix, a lot of problems all over the place. But if we're going to have an optimism conversation, this is maybe the main pillar. This is the number one thing. And I think it's no surprise that we're both optimists. I mean, obviously, we both have large families. We're very dedicated to uh, making life better for the next generation, which is our children. So no surprise, <laughs> no spoiler here, we're both optimists. But there is one area that really causes me concern, and that's actually the economy. And I've been reading uh, the work of our colleague Sharon Verbal quite closely about this. And obviously, the ratings agencies. S&P Global and Moody's investors have both downgraded Israel's outlook to negative during the course of this war. But at the same time, it's kind of interesting. 
they still think that there will be growth in the economy, not the 2% that the Bank of Israel is expecting, but a 0.5%, which I find really interesting. So among the negative outlook, there will still be growth. Khabib, how do you how do you explain that? Well, I mean, our economy is um, a bit of a funny animal. And here there's bad news that, this is a recurring theme, by the way, bad news that is actually good news. It's good news masquerading as bad news. Um, We have, and this is mentioned in all these reports that threaten to downgrade or actually downgrade. First of all, there's the momentary problem of the war. Now, Yes, huge problem. We're going to have to borrow tremendously. Um, businesses all over, you know, the North and the South are, are devastated. There's going to be billions spent on rebuilding. Um, and something like 18% of reservists who went to this war, this was a figure that was um, given by the uh, the Army and the Finance Ministry, and we ran with it in a news report. I don't know more than that news report, but something like 18% of the reservists are high-tech um, employees. And so the high-tech industry also suffered just literally a loss of manpower for the duration of the war. Now, they're mostly back at work, um, and so there is a recovery that we're probably going to start seeing in the next few months. Um, but also investment. Investment didn't come in as fast. Um, the whole global high-tech world suffered from a drop in investment over the past year. Israel suffered more. And it suffered more because of judicial reform, and it suffered more because of the war. So there are these momentary, uh, overall bumps in the road. If you have a basically healthy economy, you're going to get past them. Um, But there are also structural problems. There's this huge 10, 13, something like that percent of the country uh, that is the ultra-Orthodox community that strictly in economic terms is a tremendous liability on the Israeli economy. An average Haredi household uh, takes something like 120,000 shekels a year uh, in welfare payments of various kinds. Um, there, Half of Haredi men don't participate in the workforce. Um, that's a huge, huge drag on the economy. By the way, there's a similar but lesser phenomenon in the Arab community where women, these are for cultural reasons, the Haredi community, for cultural reasons, half the men believe they need to be studying or not working in various ways or working in a black market economy. Um, and for cultural reasons, Arab women don't participate in the workforce in roughly similar numbers. I think it's 45%, something like that. There's there's data from the finance ministry that I, I don't remember the exact recent data, but it's in the, it's at the same scale. And so the, the Arab community also, we're talking about something like 70,000 shekels per household on average. Now, there are huge numbers of Haredim that contribute to the economy, huge numbers of Arab families that contribute tremendously to the economy in everything from even things you don't expect or associate with the communities like high tech. Um, but... Nevertheless, overall, statistically, these are economic areas of the economy that are actually liabilities. But here's the thing. With those liabilities, the International Monetary Fund estimate for Israel's GDP per capita in 2024 is $53,000. $53,000 is ahead of the UK. It's ahead of the EU average. It's ahead of Taiwan, South Korea, Japan. We have an astonishingly high GDP per capita with the Haredi and Arab economies within our economy dragging us down that list. So is that a problem that we should tear our shirts and sit in sackcloth and ashes and mourn over? By the way, these are mentioned, as I said, in these reports of Moody's and other ratings agencies. Or is this a sign that we haven't nearly tapped our potential? Imagine a mass return to work or mass entry into the workforce of Arab women with huge incentives to go to higher education at the same time. Imagine the Haredi men joining the workforce, rising 30 points in that happening. Where does our GDP per capita look then? So optimism and pessimism with Israel is a little bit of a, uh, you know, the very thing that we mourn that pushes us down the list is actually a sign that we haven't nearly achieved our potential. And there's so much more that we could be accomplishing. And these are fixable by policy. One last point, you know, back in 2012, I think it was, um, Benjamin Netanyahu uh, had this incredibly smart uh, policy of introducing a negative income tax for Arab mothers. Arab mothers who couldn't work because they couldn't be paid enough to cover the um, childcare of their kids were one of the reasons that they weren't joining the workforce. And so they introduced a negative income tax for working mothers that actually meant that if a mother went to work, 
the state would then add to her salary, I forget what it was, only like 1,500 shekels, something fairly significant that could cover a lot of daycare costs for the kids. That led to a double-digit percentage increase in women, Arab women joining the workforce and drove some number, I don't remember the exact numbers, I think it was around 5 to 6% of Arab households above the poverty line. Um, this is susceptible to policy. We know that Haredi men go to work when their benefits, their government benefits are cut. We know that from Benjamin Netanyahu doing it in the past, that he won't do this stuff now is a political point. But wow, what a, what a potential for growth that just sits there waiting for us. And, and even with these liabilities, economically, not humans, humans are not liabilities, but economically, these are liabilities, we are still ahead of the UK, ahead of the EU average. That's really interesting. And definitely, I know that life of spending perhaps your entire salary on daycare when my kids were young, it was about that. But I figured that I should stay in the workforce and not leave it because after they grow up, it's much more difficult to uh, join again. So in any case, right now, the country is poised to again discuss the idea of uh, Haredi conscription enlistment into the army. And one thing I learned just uh, today, in fact, is that there is in the Netzach Yehuda program, which we discussed uh, earlier, which is formerly known as the Nachal Haredi, where uh, the fringe is mostly of Haredi or very religious society men join this uh, particular slightly controversial unit. But in any case, part of this program is uh, a an end cap, shall we say, in which these men can go to an institution called Mahon Lev, which is a kind of a technical college for uh, Orthodox men. And so I was just imagining, you know, the more Haredi or ultra-Orthodox men join the army, they're more integrated into society. And then by going into this, uh, you know, technical college, they're more integrated into the economy as well. And as you said, it's just this huge, vast, untapped potential. Right. They are good students. Um, and when they do get into the economy, they are good workers. Uh, but they do need that education. They come out of the Haredi education system with, you know, fourth, fifth grade math. It's, a, it's actually a real tremendous problem. But there are these now technical colleges with the blessing of the Haredi leadership. Um, on the Sephardi side, you saw this in even much larger scale than on the Ashkenazi side, which is mostly what we're talking about with Netzach Yehuda. Um, Rav Avadia Yosef, the great spiritual leader of Sephardi Judaism in Israel, um, of Haredi Sephardi Judaism and beyond, I think, Haredi. A lot of Sephardi Jews in Israel consider them, him their spiritual leader, even if they were not Haredi. I think 700,000 people came to his funeral in Jerusalem when he, when he passed away. Um, he actually gave the blessing to his daughter establishing a network of technical schools for women uh, in the Haredi community. And also, I think men have also gone to um, some of these programs in schools. So, yes, the potential is enormous. And without realizing that economic uh, and social and integration potential in the Arab and Haredi communities, we are at the top of the developed world. Um, also, you know, signs in the Arab community, they're also tremendous positive signs once you start looking. I think half of the student body of Haifa University is Arab Israelis. A quarter of the, or 20%, something like that, of the student body of the Technion, which is our MIT. These are the future of our high-tech industry, are Arab Israelis. And not from affirmative action. They earn their spots there. Um, and the, the Christian Arab schools in this country uh, outperform Jewish schools on average when it comes to standardized testing. So, signals of tremendous educational achievement, which, folks, educational achievement in this decade is economic achievement two decades away right from now. So, uh, those signals are, are multiplying and, and the future is, is bright, even though now things look pretty, you know, pretty bad in many ways. So we discussed social capital, we discussed the economy, we discussed slightly education, we discussed a little bit health. What else makes you optimistic, Khaviv? This one is going to be hard. I'm going to have to really do a hard job convincing. Um, our astonishing unity. We were falling apart as a country back in the day, back in judicial reform. Remember the old times, the before times? Um 
I argued then that our very polarization was a sign of our incredible and almost unique, I think, unity, in, certainly in the West. Um, you have to go to the Arab world to find that kind of sense of solidarity and unity. Um, I, I made the argument that when soldiers were signing petitions against service, they, they were saying, you know, we had, we had petitions by Golani and, and commandos and pilots um, who were saying, I won't serve if we're not a democracy anymore, right, which was the argument against the judicial reform, um, that that was in fact calling upon that fundamental plank of our unity. We are a refugee people, and this is our ethos that we defend each other. And if we're trying to access that, we're just trying to make a call to the other, we're trying to explain to the other side, we're not talking about judicial reform anymore. This is fundamental. You need to listen. Um, and, and so it's calling on a deeper unity that we don't necessarily talk about, but we all know how to access at the end of the day. Then the war started and everybody suddenly agreed, right? Suddenly it was massive unity and everybody was going into battle together. And as we said, 18% of the reservists are from the high tech industry. The high tech industry overwhelmingly votes center left. Um, leftists went to this war just, to, just as much as right wingers shoulder to shoulder, and that's how everyone understood what was happening, and everyone was astonished that our unity was so palpable and powerful, because everyone had convinced themselves that it was dismantled. Um, I stand by that argument. That unity is still there, and I'll tell you why I need to stand by that argument, because the polarization is back. The politicians are screaming again. The protests are back. Now the protests are about whether or not we prioritize going into Rafah, or we prioritize uh, the hostage release, but nevertheless, the protests are back. Here's the thing about the protests. Again, this is one of those things where we only talk about the bad thing, but the bad thing is a sign. Is The bad thing wouldn't be bad if not for fundamental underlying strength. In other words, it's a potential for how good things can be rather than a permanent deterioration. We have really worrying polling numbers. Um, this is through um, Camille Fuchs and the website called Hamadad, which uh, done by a, a former journalist and analyst, uh, Shmuel Rosner, uh, where we, they asked Israelis, um, do they believe we're going to win the war? Back in October, in the immediate aftermath of October 7, 74% said we're definitely going to win this war. And that dropped in January to 61%, and then in February to 54%. And the last Madad poll, which was, I think, last week, uh, has it down to 38%. For the first time, more Israelis think we will lose the war than, or fail to win the war. I don't know what lose means, but fail to win, which for Hamas means we lose and they win. Uh, we will not win, then believe we will win. And then when you try and piece out, why do Israelis think we're not going to win? What does that mean? What is that actually? What are they saying? Are they saying the great IDF can't? May, or do they mean the Americans are holding us back? Do they mean the civilian death toll means Hamas is invincible? What are they actually saying? And it turns out that it tracks very, very closely to trust in government, in our politicians. It tracks very closely. In other words, right wingers are much more likely, there's still a majority of right wingers, although it's less than 60%, who say that we are going to win. Everyone else, including people who call themselves center right, um, who would have voted Likud, but now vote for sort of right-wing opponents to Likud, like Gidon Sar's party, or at least poll that way. Um, everyone else is less than half percent think we're going to win. It turns out there's a very close correlation to whether you trust Benjamin Netanyahu and whether you think you're going to win. And I want to just say, you know, I want to dive into that for a minute. And I'm a little bit channeling uh, Rosner himself, who is a very smart, talented analyst who you should be reading in English and in Hebrew. Um and Rosner makes a simple argument. Um, if you take it from people concluding we can't win, okay, then that explains the protests for the hostages, right? People protesting to prioritize a hostage rescue, a hostage deal, in theory are doing something very stupid. Because if Hamas sees public pressure on the government to sign a deal, Hamas will raise their price. It actually drives the deal farther away. So what are they thinking? If you don't think victory is attainable, okay, then you will demand to get the hostage out because it's the minimum we can get out. And if you don't think victory is attainable, that's the thing. You're much more likely to suspect that Netanyahu and, and the rest of the leaders around him are dragging out the war just to avoid the political reckoning that comes after. And so those hostages are in there suffering needlessly. We're not going to win. We're not getting them out because Netanyahu is using the war essentially to campaign. You're much more likely to think that if you don't think victory is attainable, at least with this leadership. But it works the other way too. Right? If you don't trust the leaders, 
you're much less likely to think the war is winnable. So it's a kind of reinforcing cycle that's producing protests, mass protests. First of all, there's this is now most Israelis don't think this government can win this war. It's not that they don't think war is winnable, but they don't think this government can win it. There is a tremendous distrust in this leadership among the Israeli people, and it runs deep into the right. If 40% of people who won't call themselves center-right, but full right, say the war isn't going to be won, um, that distrust is just too, it's just, it's most people, most Israelis you know. You just don't know many Israelis who think this government's going to win this war. That's horrifying. But I want to take that to the worst case scenario. Here's the worst case scenario. Hamas survives this. Hamas becomes the invincible hero of the Palestinians, of the Muslim Brotherhood axis in the Middle East, the Qataris, the Turks, um, and of generally the Muslim world, parts of the Muslim world that hate Israel, of the international left parts of it that hate Israel. And that's a really bad situation. It's a situation that leaves Hamas in power in Gaza. Eventually we leave. Do we stick around forever and just have another Lebanon security zone? Eventually we leave. Hamas immediately takes over. Hamas not only survives, it is it is then empowered in the West Bank. After Mahmoud Abbas dies, there's going to be a civil war among the Palestinians for control of the West Bank. How could Hamas, that the Israelis couldn't defeat in little Gaza, not be the favored party among Palestinians in the West Bank? It is. It transforms Hamas into the Palestinian cause in a way that it it wasn't until October 7 and is trying to become now. It's a disaster. Also, within Israel, it completely validates the distrust in Netanyahu. It means Netanyahu can't survive a day. It means that the protests begin massively and huge numbers of right-wingers are at the protests because Netanyahu violated not just what the left wanted or the center wanted, but what the right wanted. And then we replace our leadership. And what are the Palestinians left with? They're left with Sinwar, the butcher of Khan Yunis, a title he earned 30 years ago when he mass-murdered Palestinians suspected of collaboration with Israel. He was sitting in an Israeli prison, not because he killed Israelis, but because he killed Palestinians. They're left with Sinwar as their leader and Hamas as their basic ideology. And we, because we're a democracy, have finally turnover, which has been very difficult to achieve with Netanyahu in power. In other words, when I'm confused, and I don't, I don't know, most Israelis think we're not going to win this at this point. I know that it tracks with distrust in Netanyahu. So I, I understand that they don't actually think our soldiers can't win this. What they think is Netanyahu can't win this. I'm then led to ask. I, I tend to believe that ordinary people are wise and elites tend to be less wise than they pretend. So if most people think we're not going to win this, maybe we're not going to win this. And then when I, when I get confused and don't know the answer, I fall back on fundamental things. Here's the fundamental things. If Hamas wins this, that's a bigger disaster for Palestine than for Israel. And we have the capacity for turnover that they don't. So optimism, deep optimism, what m else could possibly matter in this war than that we can open a new page and they're trapped in this trap. And if we do them the disservice of letting Hamas survive this, we trap Palestinians in this moment for another generation. Now, that's not optimism if you're a Palestinian, but how can I, I, I don't know how to avoid that conclusion if I'm an Israeli. In other words, even the dark things, even the sad things, even the really ter terribly worrying things signal very powerfully all of our strengths. That's a really long-term uh, look in terms of finding the optimism in, in everything that you're saying, because obviously, as we've discussed many times, Netanyahu has a very strong coalition right now, and I don't see any kind of scenario in which he will step down himself voluntarily. So we're talking about probably another three years or so, unless his own coalition falls apart, which it doesn't look like it's going to. But obviously, prophecy is dead. You know, one of the things, of course, that we've been discussing, you and I, over the past uh, seven plus months is the world opinion. And that has always made me extremely pessimistic as well. However, one thing happened last week that kind of turned the tide for me. It's as, as you were saying, the elites kind of set the tone and in terms of the leadership of the world and many voices we're hearing from cultural leaders out you know out in the global sphere it just sounds like everyone hates Israel so much but and this may sound a little silly the results from the Eurovision song contest gave me so much hope because 
while the jury votes were so poor and, you know, obviously condemning Israel for political reasons, in terms of the popular vote, Israel placed second, which, what does that mean? You know, people in their own countries and they were voting outside of Israel, Israelis could not vote. All over the world, literally all over the world, we're voting for Israel and potentially even, you know, the majority of some countries. And I know it sounds a little silly because it is a little silly song contest, but just seeing that you know, that world popular vote for the Eurovision Song Contest just made me really optimistic and, and made me think, wow, I guess maybe the world doesn't hate us as much as we're led to believe. I think that I was as stunned as you, that the popular vote would be, I think that a lot of Europeans are waking up to some of the protests that they're seeing in their countries and some of the radicalization of some of the immigrant Muslim communities. Um, that doesn't reflect all Muslims. It doesn't reflect maybe most Muslims. I frankly don't know the polling numbers of what Muslim opinion is in Western Europe and Central Europe. But it sure looks to them like this is not an Israeli problem that there are these protests that are super pro-Hamas, that we've seen protests by radical Islamist groups in Germany that openly and publicly in the public square call for Sharia law in Germany, that that's a German problem. And so maybe Israel doesn't look quite so evil in the way, ironically, the way the left and the way the Muslim world, many of the leadership and, you know, elites in the Muslim world have framed the war as a great civilizational war. Well, that doesn't necessarily put us in a bad position. I mean, I don't think it is a civilizational war. I think it's an internal civil war within Islam. I think it's a war between Israelis and Palestinians. But if you want it to be a civilizational war, you're buying us all kinds of powerful allies, um, dear enemy of ours who paints us as some kind of enemy of, of, of your entire culture and civilization. But that's also the same, you know, the same sort of public outpouring for israel that we did not that can't be jews i mean there's not no, enough there's, jews exactly so, there aren't enough jews to create some kind of cabal right. of the voting block <laughs> right and then we have this generation lab poll and axios of college students i've been on college campuses speaking a lot of angry and worried and anxious jewish college students that i've met who see what we see and see the egregious examples of violence and 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 prejudice of these protesters I don't know if that's represent. The protesters keep saying they're super peaceful, but their leaders keep saying Zionists should die. So I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how much. It's, I don't know if ten percent are radical. Cra- we we know from the arrests, the NYPD data on the arrests at Columbia that what half? I forget the exact number. Half of the people arrested were not Columbia students. So there's also that element in the mix. Um, but then we have this generation lab poll of the actual college students that Axios published, I think, a week and a half ago, something like that, and they asked people. They gave nine issues on the public agenda, including the war in Gaza. And they were issues like um, uh, educational funding and access, economic fairness and opportunity, racial justice and civil rights, climate change, gun control, nine issues. The Palestinian question, the Gaza war, came in last. They allowed people to actually um, write three of the issues as their priorities among the nine. In other words, you could name a third of the issues as your priorities. And the war in Gaza was only in the top three for 13% of students. And you had huge numbers of students. 90% of students said that it's not okay to block pro-Israel students from campus, which the protesters have been doing everywhere there have been protests. They've They've been making the claim that Zionists aren't welcome here. 81% of students said they want to punish protesters who destroy property. So what is happening on those college campuses? A lot less than it looks. And there's a lot of blowback to this among college students who don't think that the Gaza war should take over the campus and should be the only thing anybody talks about. So our position, every time you actually measure it, is better than it looks. Um, And just... The last thing that I was surprised by was the UN's reduction in the Gaza death toll. The UN's reduction of the Gaza death toll from 35,000 to roughly 25,000 is a shift from the, of the UN um, from following the Gaza media office numbers, which are just Hamas propaganda, to Gaza Ministry of Health numbers, which are Hamas run and can't put out numbers Hamas doesn't approve of, or at least couldn't back when Hamas was fully in control of Gaza, 
But nevertheless, for months, the Ministry of Health numbers have been much lower than the media office numbers. And UN officials have been perfectly happy to run with media office numbers over Gaza Health Ministry numbers. And this correction now, they even, they're trying to hide the scale of their just fall into the entire institutional pipeline of the UN. Nobody raised an alarm about this. Nobody asked a question about this. And now they're trying to hide the scale of of, of what they did by just saying, well, it's 10,000 unidentified. And the 10,000 delta that's unidentified, what they mean by unidentified on social media, people rushed in to defend the numbers and say, well, those are bodies that we don't know who they are. No, they're not. According to the UN's own statement about what it just did, Those are media reports of casualties that nobody can find bodies for or missing persons reports for. Those unidentified means we can't find any sign of them. They were just reported, but not actually any kind of um, corpses or anything on the ground. Now, you know, I don't want to celebrate because there are still thousands of dead civilians, many thousands of dead civilians. By the way, that 25,000, give or take number, includes the combatants. And we don't know how much that is. Hamas admitted 6,000 like three months ago. Israel thinks it killed 14,000, whatever, somewhere in between. I don't know. But the point is, there's still thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dead civilians. This is not a, therefore Israel is great and we can walk away and we don't have to worry about it. We have to worry about it. Seriously think, talk, learn about it. But it does mean we can't trust the UN about it. And we can't trust the international organizations about it. And we can't trust the New York Times that quotes these numbers It for a little bit period, because people complained, said Gaza run health ministry numbers. But it's been running with media office numbers, not bothering with even health ministry numbers, and not bothering to say Hamas run for quite a while. So we can't trust those New York Times numbers either. Now, again, doesn't exonerate us, but maybe our army has been more careful than even we ourselves have argued and understood. That's what the UN numbers seem to indicate. i Don't know if that solves the war or solves the problems we have in the international debate, but it sure as heck is a good thing for me to hear. So signs of good news proliferate. And if we are attuned to them, I don't think we can walk away from this moment, even in our deep sadness. We just had Yom HaZikaron. I remembered people I knew and um, who who both, you know, died on October 7th, um, were taken hostage. Not all of them are out, and also a soldier, a young soldier who was killed in Gaza in battle. But even this moment of deep sadness, our strengths are shining through. And if you project the good and the bad forward, the good overwhelms the bad in the data. You don't have to be overly optimistic to, to see it. So, optimism. Optimism. Wow, thank you so much, Khaviv. Everyone needs it. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks for listening to the Times of Israel's What Matters Now. Please check out another installment next week. If you have any comments or questions about this or any other episode, please drop us an email to podcast at timesofisrael.com. Until next week, shalom.